You know how sometimes everyone thinks they know the truth? But really, only you know the truth? Everyone else just sees the facade, but you see through to the bloated corpse of reality. They only see the pretty colors, but I see, I see rainbow bright. Rainbow Bright was born when a team of legal, marketing, and public relations executives for Hallmark's new licensing division decided that they loved money very much. They wanted to compete with American Greeting Card successful creations like Ziggy, Holly Hobby, The Get Along Gang, and most especially, Strawberry Shortcake, whose successful television specials have been running since 1980. So to get a piece of that sweet strawberry flavored television money, Hallmark decided that they would make their own strawberry shortcake. But instead of a tiny little strawberry farmer, she'd be an alien with like the most horrifying origin story I've ever encountered in a children's show. To be fair, the first three episodes of Rainbow Bride are like pretty cute and normal. It's not until the fourth episode when her origin story comes into play that things start to get pretty weird. You know, how we traditionally save the origin story for the fourth episode of a television show. Hallmark hired a guy named Howard R. Cohen to write The Beginning of Rainbow Land, Rainbow Bright's origin story. He had a ton of experience in writing for the screen. Um, perhaps you've heard of Friday the 13th? Well, he wrote Saturday the 14th, and its sequel, Saturday the 14th Strikes Back. He also worked as an editor for Playboy magazine, and if you go just a little bit further back into his IMDb history, he wrote several screenplays, including a screenplay for Vampire Hookers, and another film called The Young Nurses, the tagline for which is, in this hospital, the patients always come first, which just sounds like a very normal hospital. I know it sounds crazy, but I have a theory that Hallmark hired a guy who had mostly written softcore porn to write the backstory for their strawberry shortcake knockoff. Yes, it's weird that this is the guy that they chose to write Rainbow Bright's origin story, but honestly, it's kind of weird that they thought that Rainbow Bright needed an origin story. Like, Strawberry Shortcake doesn't have an origin story. She's small. She farms strawberries. Further questions? Don't care. That's how you write an origin story. Okay, so let's break down what actually happens in the episode. It starts off with Rainbow Land looking kind of like an 80s metal album cover. There's lots of lightning and thunder, birds with fangs, a four-horned goat monster. It's pretty spooky. And then Rainbow Bright shows up and she's immediately got critiqued. It's even worse close up. I get it, it's not everybody's cup of tea, but you're kind of a guest here, Rainbow, so like maybe simmer down. You know, just walk into someone's house and go, whoa, this place looks bad. She's dropped onto a planet by a sphere of light that calls her Wisp and tells her to find the light and the color of this land and it will be free and the darkness will disappear. The light isn't British, I don't think. I think I made the light British. She sets off on a journey to find the sphere of light, not to be mistaken for the sphere of light that just dropped her off from we don't know where. Watching this as an adult, you feel an immediate sense of concern for Rainbow Bright because the first thing she does on this very scary planet is ask a bird for advice. You haven't seen a sphere of light by any chance, have you? <coughs> Your concern for Rainbow would not be misplaced. In the first episode alone, she nearly gets eaten by that unhelpful bird, an insane ram, a centipede monster, some pissed off fish, an eel monster, and literally even the trees. She also falls off multiple cliffs. has a rough time and through a lot of it she kind of seems pretty incompetent but to be fair she's being watched after a while you start to wonder is rainbow bright really incompetent or is she luring her enemies into a false sense of security her main opponent is the king of shadows he's the current ruler of the sun named land and we don't know much about him other than that he's scary and magical and apparently he really likes lightning which is why there's so much of it like lightning is to the king of shadows as throw pillows are to my mom's couch so Rainbow hooks up with a sprite named Twink, another native of the planet who's not doing so hot in the survival department, and with a horse named Starlight who used to be a statue. 
and the three of them fall into a river and then find a baby that Starlight suggests they leave to die of exposure. Just what we need, a baby. Harsh, Starlight. Then again, Rainbow did kind of steal that baby. She just picks it up off the ground like it's a nickel. No, hey, anybody around here missing a baby or anything? She just straps that baby to her back and continues on her very dangerous mission that literally almost killed her two seconds ago. So now the gang's all here, Rainbow and her buds and her stolen baby are all ready to continue on their adventure when they hear the cries of a trapped color kid. His name is Red Butler because you know, kids love gone with the wind puns. Red Butler explains that he's one of the color kids. They're in charge of the sprites who harvest the planet's most valuable resource, the color sprinkles. That seems suspect to me. I mean, Twink is the only sprite that we've seen and he's been doing just fine for like a full episode with no color kids around. He hasn't even mentioned the color kids. I bet if you paid the sprites a fair wage, you could totally cut the color kids out of the deal entirely. The color kids pretty much seem to spend their time hanging out, playing kickball, chilling, you know, fighting Murky and Lurky, solving some mysteries, and the entire time the sprites are down in the mine, all alone, mining. Rainbow doesn't seem to find this arrangement suspect at all. She doesn't even ask Twink like, hey, is this guy your boss or anything? She's just like, dope, I'll rescue all the color kids and then you guys and I and my stolen baby will overthrow the king and we'll make this place beautiful. Hey, you know what it's called when someone comes into a country, aligns with imprisoned former leaders and then overthrows the current leader? That's called a coup. If one person is in charge and you kill that person and you're like, well, guess I'm in charge now, you did a coup. Rainbow Bright did a coup. And this is where I really start to question Rainbow's motives. She has a very clear like vision for this world from the moment she steps into it. She wants everything to be beautiful and happy. And you know what, honestly, screw that. There's a scene where she's yelling at an ugly tree that genuinely upset me. Don't you want to have green leaves and beautiful birds in your branches? <gasps> The tree, fully the tree. I sympathize with the tree in that altercation. In fact, like I've been the tree. <laughs> yes, this world is scary, but it's the only world that the insane ram and gross tree have ever known. What's gonna happen to them when Rainbow Bright takes over? She says point blank over and over again what her agenda is for this world. And the people who would do well in her regime like Twink and Starlight and the color kids are all on board. Everyone else is like, hell no, I love being a gross tree. That's where I am in my life right now, Rainbow. Get out of my face. But of course she doesn't. She just keeps telling everyone how ugly they are and how she's going to make them beautiful. And she's completely oblivious to their blatant response of like, no thanks, I'd rather just eat you. If you're saying to yourself, well, do the bird and the tree really get a vote on how the world is ran? The horse gets a vote, so if Starlight, in the context of this universe, is a person, then the bird and the tree are full voting members of the public, and I'm sure they like the way the King of Shadows is running things just fine. I personally would probably hate a world where everything was bright and happy all the time. Sometimes you need a break to just be a gross tree. Okay, sorry, where was I? Voting, gross tree, the King of Shadows is good, right. So then the King of Shadows sends his henchmen, Murky and Lurky, to kidnap the baby so that he can use it as bait to lure Rainbow Bright to his castle. Okay, that sounds bad, but can I remind you again that was not Rainbow's baby in the first place? There's no five second rule for babies you find on the ground. Rainbow Bright frees the color kids and together they're going to save the baby and murder the King of Shadows. Yes, murder the King of Shadows. A very dark corner of the Rainbow Bright wiki notes that throughout the entire series, the King of Shadows holds the distinction of being the only major villain to have ever actually been permanently killed. Like he's super dead. And if there was a coroner's report, it would say patient was strangled to death by Rainbow. The only way she manages to overthrow the King is with the help of the Sphere of Light which I could be wrong about this because it is extremely unclear, but I think that the Sphere of Light she needed to overthrow the King was also the same orb that dropped her off on the planet in the first place. So this was essentially all like a scavenger hunt for a thing that she already had to start with. If it's not that orb, it just happens to be another all powerful orb. It's just like a lot of unrelated powerful orbs for one show and if it is that orb it just seems a little weird that it would be like 
all you need to overthrow the king is me. So, you know, bye. I'm going to go hide in a baby now. All right, the orb was the baby the entire time. Or the orb was inside the baby the entire time. I don't know. The Rainbow Bright Wiki lists her as alive, so I guess she didn't die, but she definitely dissolves, sort of, in a, in a bright light. Don't ask me, I didn't write this. The guy who wrote Vampire Hookers wrote this. All I can say for sure is that the orb of light from the beginning shows up again. It tells Witch, congratulations, she did a good job. Agree to disagree, orb of light. And then she tells her her name is Rainbow now and that this is now Rainbow Land and she's in charge of all the color in the universe. Then Rainbow Land transforms and now it looks like this. Everyone is beautiful and happy and perfect, but what happened to my personal hero, the gross tree? There's three possible options. Number one, Rainbow Thanos snapped like half the planet out of existence when she gained power. Number two, gross tree is alive, but he's now forcibly beautified with leaves and birds in his branches. He longs for death and smiles at his dictator queen. Three, there is one area of resistance in Rainbow Land, Murky and Lurky's home, it's called the Pits. And I guess it's possible that every undesirable creature in Rainbow Land was like confined to this little area, but that doesn't seem very likely. Yeah, that doesn't seem very likely. They're probably all dead. Okay, so this is where my thoughts on the episode get a little... I mean, what do we even know about Rainbow Bright? All that we know for sure is that she comes from a planet that isn't Rainbow Land, so she's an alien an invading alien who killed the ruler of that planet and assumed control of it. Come to think of it, isn't it kind of crazy how she looks exactly like the color kids? Even though she comes from another planet, I mean, she dresses exactly like them and they just happen to be the people that she needs to align with in order to gain control of the planet's most powerful resource, the color sprinkles. Does she even really look like that? I mean, honestly, she could be anything. The two-part special ends with everyone who remains celebrating that they're free. Free to work in the mines for eternity, for Rainbow Bright. Wow, sounds like a real utopia. And it's all thanks to our shape-shifting alien dictator, Rainbow Bright. Aw, we love her. Cause we have to, or she'll disappear us. Honestly, the entire plot is like weirdly violent, kind of convoluted. It doesn't really feel like a children's show. It feels more like a rewritten script for a 70s science fiction softcore porno. For sure is that on a scale from hey arnold to not hey arnold i'm gonna say this deep drive into rainbow bright was like pretty hey arnold it's metal and it's weird and i like it it's hey arnold what do you guys think did this make you like rainbow bright more or less you can comment below also be sure to like and subscribe and you can check out more funny content from me and other very funny people on bunnyears.com also um you can follow bunny ears on twitter at bunny ears web at bunny ears web and you can follow me on twitter at you know lydia bye you are freaking lumberjack Wow, that was a really good video. Uh, don't forget to check out more here at uh, Bunny Ears. Uh, you can hit that uh, subscribe button, the like button, and don't forget to hit the bell thing, the ring-a-ding-ding. -ding. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's, that's actually everything that I'm supposed to say. I don't know. Ah, oh, jeez. <laughs>